Welcome to Asthma Treatment and Nursing Care, Part 2. Part 1 included asthma pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, and diagnostic tests. Part 2 will include treatment, drug therapy, nursing diagnoses, and nursing care. I know the disclaimer is very small on the side of this slide, but basically it says we do everything we can to give you accurate information. However, this information is not meant to substitute for your professor's instruction, but instead to supplement. So for asthma treatment, you should go back to pathophysiology. We need to open the airways and decrease inflammation, which will then decrease the mucus. So all patients need short-acting beta agonists, or as on here, SABAs, or SABAs, I guess. So for example, that's albuterol. They're the first thing to do no matter what, because they relax the airways. With persistent asthma, you also add a controller med medication, ICS or inhaled corticosteroids, things like Flovent. Remember, these are not a rescue drug. They take several days to work. And sometimes we give oral steroids too. So if we have albuterol, Flovent, and oral uh, prednisone ordered, all three are ordered. Which one of those do you give first? Always the albuterol because we always, always want to do something to relax those airways. And so that's the first thing when you're given a choice of multiple drugs. Yes, we give all the others, but that uh, short acting beta agonist is the first thing we want to do so we can open those airways. Acute exacerbations, you give those short acting every 20 minutes for three times usually. Oftentimes they'll need oral corticosteroids for a short term where they'll taper them and then oxygen if their SATs are low. For severe exacerbation, you can do continuous uh, short acting beta agonists, so a continuous inhalation treatment and then add Atrovent to that. And they'll give oral or probably more likely IV corticosteroids every four to six hours. Sometimes they will give Heliox. Heliox is a combination of helium and oxygen. And what that does is it lowers gas density. So theoretically, the oxygen is able to travel into the lungs easier. So that's why they do that. Drugs that we do not give anymore, especially for an acute exacerbation, are theophylline, mucolytics, sedatives, and antibiotics. Now, it doesn't really help you to memorize a list. You need to know why. So theophylline is very easy to get toxic on, and it actually is much better long term. So it's not good to give for a short term attack. Mucolytics, they will sometimes use with chronic problems where they break down that chronic accumulation of mucus, but because a lot of the mucolytics have a risk of bronchospasm, they're not a good idea to use in acute exacerbations. Sedatives. What do sedatives do to the respiratory drive? They decrease it, so we don't want to do that when they have asthma because that will, as they work harder and harder, we don't want to slow their breathing down till they're better, and this could falsely slow their breathing where they can't breathe deep enough. And then antibiotics. Rarely does an asthmatic need antibiotics with an acute exacerbation because it's usually not an infectious process. Sometimes we'll find an infectious process going on along with that exacerbation, but it doesn't really do anything for the exacerbation itself. Now I've given you just an outline of drug therapy for acute and for chronic. And I'm just going to remind you of what some of these drugs do. So again, with acute attack, we want bronchodilators and anti-inflammatories. So the beta adrenergic agonist, that SABAs we talked about, it, you see the list of drugs, the common ones, albuterol, Iupin, Zopinex, adrenaline, or epinephrine. Remember, these are rescue drugs. They work within minutes. Also remember, it very, very common to raise the heart rate quite high and to cause tremors, like their hands will shake, they feel very, very shaky, and cause them to be anxious. That's a very expected side effect, not something we would stop a drug for, except 
we would need to be very cautious in a cardiac patient because of the tachycardia that these drugs are going to cause. So again, when you're looking at test questions, when you see things about, oh, it's making my heart race or I'm getting shaky, those are expected side effects. Now, when we overuse these rescue drugs, they can cause a rebound bronchospasm. So patients do need to be taught that they should use them when they need them and use them as rescue but not overuse them. Best if they're used in combination with the corticosteroids to also decrease the inflammatory process. And ultimately our goal if we're doing good teaching is that they never need to use these drugs for rescue because we've maintained them so well at home. Chronic drug therapy. So with the chronic drug therapy, we also have bronchodilators, but we have different types. So if you look at this slide, you'll see the beta adrenergic agonists, but these are long acting ones. So LABAs instead of SABAs, the methylxanthine derivatives and anticholinergics. Then we have anti-inflammatories. We have corticosteroids, but those are the inhaled ones. Mast cell stabilizers also inhaled and leukotriene modifiers. So we'll talk about each of them shortly. So the beta adrenergic agonists, again, long acting. We never use these as a single therapy, a monotherapy. These are always used if they're also taking an inhaled corticosteroid. We also can never use them as a rescue. They're long acting, 12 hours and so we can't use them as rescue. They do have combinations that include the anti-inflammatories and those are drugs you're probably familiar with like Advair and Simbicort. Then we have the methylxanthine derivatives, theophylline and amylophylline. These are the drugs that are very easy for people to become toxic on. So we use them only for alternatives when other things are not working. They're oral or IV, they are not inhaled, and they have a lot of side effects and a lot of toxicity problems. And then the anticholinergics primarily is atrovent or ipratropium. These are less effective than those beta adrenergic agonists. And we can use them for quick relief, especially if they don't tolerate SAB as well, like in a cardiac patient that can't tolerate that uh, tachycardia, but they have to be nebulized usually with one of the SABAs, and they cause a lot of dry mouth. The corticosteroids you generally know about, remember corticosteroids or orally have lots and lots and lots of bad side effects, but inhaled, their primary problem is to cause mouth sores, so you must rinse your mouth after using those inhalers. Um, and those inhalers have to be used every day because they're a long term, they are not a rescue at all. Similar to the mast cell stabilizers and the leukotriene modifiers, Singular, Accolade, these are found to help asthmatics, and these are actually um, tablets that they swallow. So a lot of questions are asked about correct use of drug therapy. So make sure you know the key things that I've listed here. So MDIs are the meter dose inhalers where you can add a spacer. DPIs you cannot add a spacer to. You shake them before you use them. And to make them work, to activate them, you have to coordinate the breath and then that causes the inhalation of the medication. If they're using a spacer, that makes it a lot easier because they just push the button and then when they breathe in, the, the medicine comes in from the spacer. So spacers make a huge difference. They need to hold their breath for 10 seconds. If you could see me, what I'm doing is lifting each of my fingers up slowly and that's how they should count. This is oftentimes asked as a test question, so 10 is the number. An old wife tells, wife's tale is to float them in water, shake them to see if they're empty. That is not a good way to tell. Now the newer ones have numbers on them and they kind of need to know how often they use them because they can sound empty even when you shake them and floating them in water does not work. Again, that's asked on test questions. The DPIs or dry powder inhalers are simpler to use because you don't have to coordinate any breathing with the inhalation. You can see a picture there to the right. If you've seen an Advair inhaler, that's one example. 
here's the key they have to breathe in deeply and quickly so that's oftentimes what's asked to see if you understand the difference between DPIs and MDIs still hold the breath for 10 seconds and you cannot breathe into them that puts moisture inside and that will clog up the thing and the powders won't work so they have to take that breath away so they breathe in but not blow into the device and then nebulizers convert those drug solutions into mists like you see below so why do we prefer inhaled drugs to oral drugs inhalation is work works faster than oral drugs for one and then it also reduces systemic side effects now we still have some like the short-acting bronchodilators causing tremor which we expect and um, but that's why we want to use inhaled over oral drugs very important that you know the difference between those two the MDIs and the DPIs so health promotion interventions I'm not going to cover those much because it's things you know so we want them to avoid any personal triggers because everybody's are different keep dust out of their house avoid cold air like covering their mouth with the scarf avoid anything they might be allergic to Another important one is this next one, though. If they have any upper respiratory infection or sinusitis, they should get treatment quickly. A lot of times, those kinds of infections will aggravate and cause an asthma exacerbation. Good fluid intake. You know, it's not okay to just know good. Two to three liters a day is what people should have. Good nutrition. Taking their medicines before they exercise so they don't have to wait to take rescue inhalers when they can't breathe. They can take them before exercise to prevent them from ever having an attack in the first place. Acute care interventions. We already talked about the short acting beta agonists. Um, you can give those several times. Remember that louder wheezing can occur as the airways open, so that is not always a bad sign. Sometimes remember you have that silent chest where you don't hear wheezing because it's too tight to pass any air through, and you give them those beta, those short acting bronchodilators, and it opens up, and now they're wheezing louder, and that is actually a good sign. A more important sign to know if they're getting better is is their O2 saturation improving? other symptoms that wheezing may continue even though they're getting better really important that we reduce um, anxiety so which do you think works better saying you gotta slow your breathing down or saying okay I want you to breathe with me in out no 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 you gotta breathe with me in out in out of course they can't slow their breathing so telling them to do that isn't helpful ask them to breathe with you at a slow rate and pursuit breathing we use this for lots of respiratory problems remember what they're for and how you do it because that's oftentimes tested so it prolongs expiration they inhale slowly through the nose not the mouth the nose you never puff out your cheeks and if they practice exhaling like they're blowing through a straw that helps them learn how to do it so again this is often tested ambulatory and home care interventions our goal is again that we don't want them ever to have to use their rescue inhaler and never have an acute exacerbation so we're trying to prevent and the best way for that to happen is for them to use their medications properly know what triggers them and using a peak flow meter daily and you've got to understand the correct way to do this it's not an average of three blows it is the best of three blows so they blow out as hard as they can they do not inhale they blow out like they're blowing out a birthday candle and then every day they do that usually in the morning sometimes evening too and they take the best of the three that then tells them what's normal for them and as you see on this little peak flow meter on the right there's a red a yellow and green once they know what their normal is which is based on height and weight but it's also based on the individual once they know their normal they put that little sticker on green is 80 to 100 percent of their normal and there's no changes 
yellow when they're 50 to 80 percent of their normal so if their normal is 300 and they blow 160 they're in the yellow zone during that time they need to add their short acting um, bronchodilator more frequently so usually every four hours regardless of how they're feeling this will a lot of times prevent them from going to the ER so they have to do more work if they're in the yellow zone if they're in the red zone so they're if their normal is 300 and they blow 150 they need to take their short acting bronchodilator and then call, call their doctor or go to the emergency room there are oftentimes questions asked about this and it wants to know do you know these ranges and do you know what they need to do so if they're 300 and they blow a 280 they're in the green and they need to do nothing different. They just continue their normal routine. So make sure you understand that because there's lots of questions asked about those. Finally, nursing diagnoses. This is one of my pet peeves. There are only three nursing diagnoses for respiratory diseases and that's impaired gas exchange, ineffective airway clearance, and ineffective breathing pattern. You have to make sure you use the correct one. A lot of times our interventions are very similar but you have to pick the right diagnoses. So to have impaired gas exchange you must have a low O2 saturation or a low blood gas PaO2. If those are not low you do not have impaired gas exchange. So one of your as evidenced by has to be a low O2 sat. Ineffective airway clearance could be from a couple of things, but in the case of asthma, it's usually from that increased mucus uh, production. And so that means they're, they have stuff that needs to be coughed up, but they can't get it coughed up. That's the only time you should use that. So there could be, it could be from secretions or mucus, but it could also be they have a weak cough. It could also be they have pain, and so they don't want to cough because of pain. Not common with asthma, it would be the secretions. And then lastly is ineffective breathing pattern. This could be they're hyperventilating or shallow breathing. It could also be that they're, they have pain or sedation so they're not breathing deeply enough. Um, so make sure you pick the correct diagnoses. So real quickly, some of the interventions we would do with impaired gas exchange is obviously to give them oxygen. We might have them do pursed lip breathing so we open up the alveoli more with that uh, prolonged expiration. Incentive spirometer for the same reason or PEEP if they're on a ventilator. Interventions for ineffective airway clearance would include giving them increased fluids so that you you uh, liquefy those secretions, splinting their chest if they're having pain so that when they do have a cough that you help with the pain. And then ineffective breathing pattern interventions again is related to the cause. If it's pain, dealing with the pain, if it's anxiety causing hyperventilation, having them breathe with you and slowing their breathing. So if you haven't watched Asthma Overview Part 1, you can watch that. Look at our website, pocketprofnursing.com, and I'll have my notes for this video. I'll have some other videos and some gains to test your knowledge of asthma. And then watch for more of our videos and an app coming soon. We do appreciate your feedback, so we'd love for you to comment, suggest topics, ask questions. Click that like or dislike button. Share this video if you found it helpful for you. Someone else will find it helpful. And subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll be the first to see our new videos. Thanks for watching.